Donc, euh, bonsoir à tous. Euh, L'équipe de Art Speaks est ravie de vous accueillir ici ce soir pour une conférence très spéciale que nous préparons euh, depuis maintenant euh, près d'un an, euh, donc sur un sujet qui nous tient particulièrement à cœur, la crise climatique. We're all so delighted to see you all this evening to, and to introduce you to two of the most brilliant writers on the climate. Uh, before we get started, I would like to take a few uh, seconds um, and to say a few words on behalf of Art Speaks. Uh, we would like to express gratitude for and honor uh, the lands and waters on which we are gathered tonight. Art Speaks is located on unceded indigenous lands of the Ganyangeha Ga Nation. It is known as Jojage in Ganyangeha and Muniyang in Anishinaabemowin. It is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it is home to many indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connection with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples in the Montreal community. So we are grateful to our colleagues at Paragraph Bookstore, uh, La bi bi Librairie Paragraph, who have brought books by both authors this evening. Uh, some of you may have already gotten some just before we started, uh, and you will be able to get some following the talk. And I'm so thrilled to share that Amitav Ghosh and David Wallace-Wells will be uh, signing copies for about 30 minutes following the talk at, in the Petit Outremont, which is just outside of this room. So as always, there will be a 30-minute Q&A uh, following the talk. So myself and my colleague Pardis will be um, in the aisles with the mics. So you could just line up behind the mic and uh, we'll, we'll go through the questions. Um, and we would really appreciate it if you took the time right now to put your uh, phones on silent mode. <laughs> Um, and thank you all for your presence, and I am now very happy to introduce the founder of Art Speaks, uh, Lillian Maurer, who will be presenting our speakers tonight. Nous sommes fiers des no nombreuses conférences sur l'art que nous avons organisées, réunissant certaines des figures les plus uniques et les plus perspicaces travaillant dans le domaine des arts aujourd'hui. Bien sûr, nous continuerons à faire exactement cela. However, this fall, I took a detour. I felt compelled to host a conversation on the climate crisis, a subject that creates unease and anxiety in many of us, and one that Marjan and I felt strongly that we should address. On that note, I want to take this moment to wholeheartedly thank Marjan Bazadi for her dedication to Art Speaks and for the many talents she brings to making an event like this a success. I've, I've, I've said it before, you're a joy to work with. Thank you, Marjan. And thank you, Pardis, for your invaluable help. A few years ago, a friend of a friend told me how deeply affected she was after hearing David talk at an event she attended. I bought his book, which I read with bated breath, I must admit, and decided I had to invite him to Montreal for Art Speaks. I am proud and excited that David Wallace Wells, I can see her, and, uh, <laughs> and Amitav Ghosh, two men who come to the subject of climate change, not as scientists, but as concerned chroniclers, chroniclers of our time, are here tonight to walk us through where we are and where we're going. David Wallace Wells is an opinion writer at the New York Times who writes on climate change, technology, the future of the planet, and how we live on it. His pieces are highly literate, clear, and informative, and I always look forward to opening my inbox and finding a new article to think about. His book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, is a gripping, detailed account of all the different facets of the climate crisis, but to quote David, This book is not about the science of warming, it's about what warming means to the way we live on the planet. Amitav Ghosh is a multiple award-winning novelist of books such as The Glass Palace, The Great Derangement, The Nutmeg's Curse, and the Ibis Trilogy. 
On a lovely note close to home, Amitav won the Grand Prix at the Blue Metropolis Literary Festival right here in Montreal in 2011. You're very appreciated in this city. Amitav's books on cli climate were a revelation to me. He writes about climate through the lens of history, literature, and culture. He makes us aware of the legacy of colonialism and how the decisions made then can you continue to affect us today. Please welcome David and Amitav. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's great to be in Montreal. It's great to be at Art Speaks, and it's especially a privilege to be here with Amitav on stage. This is a, um, we're hoping it's a kind of a back and forth open conversation, but since I sometimes pretend to be an actual journalist, I'll be the one kind of shepherding us forward. Um, and I think, um, as was mentioned, we're probably going to be talking for about an hour and then have a conversation with you um, first year and then if you're up for it, um, back somewhere doing book signing. So um, I'm hoping, we're hoping we can cover a lot of ground tonight. We can talk about um, culture of climate change, how discourse is changing, the geopolitics um, confronting us alongside or through climate change. Um, but I wanted to just start by asking Amitav a little bit of a kind of a stock take question and maybe ask you all to think about the same as, as he answers, which is about this summer. Um, we're living now on a planet that is hotter than has, it has ever been in the entire history of human civilization. We've set record temperature levels on a global basis now for a few months in a row. And in fact, the anomalies this month in September are record-breaking anomalies. So they're not just the hottest September ever there hotter by a larger margin than any September temperatures ever have been before. And we're seeing a lot of quite dramatic events all around the world. Um, the wildfires in Canada are the thing that are most front of mind to me. Um, but I don't think many people, even Canadians, truly appreciate just how off the charts these fires are. There, three times more land has burned this year than the, has ever burned before in Canadian history. And the fires this year in Canada have released more carbon than the entire rest of the Canadian economy. In fact, three times as much as all of your um, fossil fuels, all of your industry, all of your transportation, all of your agriculture, all of your logging. The forest fires have released um, three times as much carbon as all of that. I was just recently in the Northwest Territories where 70% of the territory was evacuated um, due to fire. But I think about the floods in Libya where um, I think perhaps 20,000 people died, the deadliest flood event this century, or the wildfires in Maui in, in, um, in the US, which was the deadliest American fire in more than a century. Um, we've had heat temperatures broken all around the world. Um, so every summer, it seems, we're now being confronted again in the Northern Hemisphere by unbelievably difficult challenges um, from climate change. And yet, this summer, we're also told a fair amount about progress. Yesterday, the International Energy Agency released a big report saying we can still limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is what was called for in the Paris Accords. I don't know about you, I see a lot of charts about renewable um, deployment going up, and um, it's a bit of a discordant time to be thinking about these things, not even to mention the geopolitics that surround all that transition. So Amitav, just to sort of start the back and forth, what's your mood about climate these days? I mean, how are you thinking about it? How has your experience of this summer been? Um, and what sense do you make of all of those messy and complicated stories that I'm sure many people in the audience tonight have been thinking about in their waking hours, but maybe also as they struggle to sleep. Sure. Well, let me say, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be here. I love this city. It's always wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. And it's uh, really such a pleasure and privilege to be doing this with David, uh, whose uh, books have been uh, really both informative and inspiring for me. And we've had many conversations on these uh, issues. Uh, you know, David, I think one of the real problems that arises in relation to the whole discourse of, around climate is that so much, so much of this discourse comes from scientists, 
and uh, not just scientists, but let's say about 90% of the discourse around climate uh, is produced by uh, basically Americans, uh, Australians, Americans, Europeans, comes out of Western think tanks, universities, etc. So already we get a certain way of, uh, we are presented with a certain framework for it, you know. And so, you know, numbers and figures and so on uh, play an, an extraordinarily uh, a large a part in, the, in, in this whole discourse. And I think that makes it in many ways often a very misleading uh, uh, discourse, you know, because it's true that, uh, uh, you know, the future is already here, but it is very un unevenly distributed, you know. So this summer, for example, I was reading uh, about these horrific things happening in Hawaii, happening in uh, Canada, these terrible uh, fires. But it so happened that I actually uh, was in Italy, uh, in Tuscany for a month from May to June. Uh, and it was very, <laughs> the weather was really very nice. And from there I went to the Alps where again it was very nice. And from there I went to uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Again, the weather was really, I mean, I, I would say Kenya was actually cold. And Tanzania was nice, it was, uh, from there I went to India. Uh, and I was traveling in India for six weeks. Uh, again, uh, the weather was very nice. And it was strange, I mean, I was reading this, uh, I was, re uh, you know, talking to my children who were in uh, Manhattan. Uh, they couldn't breathe the air, everything was brown, and uh, you know, it was, uh, it was terrible. But I think it's very important for us to remember that the, uneven the unevenness of the distribution is one of the really strange effects of what's going on in the planet. Now, you know, for years, the whole sort of climate movement has always said uh, that it's the global south that will suffer the most. And this has been a sort of continuous trope uh, in, in the whole discourse around climate. And I think this is a very, very unfortunate way of presenting uh, the whole matter because in fact, I think a very good case could be made to say that in fact the countries that are worst affected are often countries in the, uh, in the global north. You know, certainly I think the country that's worst affected by climate change, just in terms of, uh, just in terms even if you uh, look, at, look at the money, uh, is the United States, you know. Italy is incredibly badly affected. Italy used to have, a, a, you know, like 20 uh, severe weather events until about, until about the year 2000. In the last 20 years, uh, this has accelerated to the point where Italy now has four or five extreme weather events every day, you know. So I think geography has a lot to do with it, and I think history has a lot to do with it. Because I think it's the way that certain landscapes have been engineered that make them especially vulnerable. So you see these huge wildfires. Uh, well, it's no coincidence, I think, that they're breaking out on the most engineered landscapes. Uh, whether you take California, or you take uh, uh, southeastern Australia, uh, again, uh, you know, you look at the Po Basin in Italy, you know, that's one of the earliest uh, landscapes to be um, engineered. And the Po River is now almost running dry. So I do think that, you know, the, it, within this climate discourse, I think it's a, it's a great mistake that they don't figure in, you know, historical differences and, uh, you know, dif differences of geography often. So it's always presented within this framework of absolutes, you know. You yourself uh, wrote such a, uh, su such a good piece on, on heat and how, you know, just putting up the well, wet bulb temperature doesn't really tell you very much about how uh, the impacts unfold. Yeah, just to explain that a little bit, um, you know, climate scientists worrying about the climate future have often talked about the risk of heat stress and heat death in terms of what's called wet bulb temperature, which is a, a mixture of heat and humidity, and the, the, um, the sort of projection that they made um, was that at a certain point, you know, 
things could be so hard for the human body, even a young, healthy human body, um, that it wouldn't continue, it wouldn't be able to continue to cool off, and you'd have some quite significant kind of mass heat stroke, mass heat death events. Um, and they did experiments to try to isolate exactly what that level, um, what the, where that level was and how far different parts of the world were from it. Um, they you know, had all these undergraduates running around in laboratories and sweating and collapsing and measuring exactly when that happened. And, um, and then they published these, these findings which informed in a very profound way, I think, um, the basic understanding of the heat future of the planet for many climate scientists and then through them, many people like me kind of keeping up with the climate science literature. Um, and over the last few years, we've started to see parts of the world, particularly um, in the Middle East and South Asia, approach or even exceed some of those temperature limits. And people are suffering in those places as a result, and they're taking shelter from the heat and not going outside during the day, and you know their lives are profoundly disrupted. But we haven't seen the sort of mass mortality events that many scientists predicted, even in cities where you know a city of 200,000 people is above what we were told was the maximum survivable limit for human bodies um, for a period of six or eight hours, and close to it for a period of a few days or even a week, which um, the longevity and the duration of these events is, is just as important as the intensity of them. Um, and I started to puzzle over this and talk to the scientists that I know, um, people who work on the, on the kind of heat side, but also on the adaptation side, about what was going on, particularly um, this heat wave, this kind of historic heat wave that swept across South Asia last, um, last spring into the early summer, which was much longer and more intense. Um, than had been experienced in the region before, even in a region that had experienced quite a lot of and quite regular heat waves. Um, and what I sort of uncovered was that, yeah, our narrative about our risk here was projected from, you know, I, I don't mean the global north in the wealth sense, like literally like countries north in the world whose populations were simply not all that exposed or acclimated to temperatures of this kind. And that um, our the model that we should adopt or try to cultivate is much more complicated and sophisticated and nuanced. It has to do with how early in the season the heat wave comes because if you have a really hot August, it's actually easier for you than a really hot May because your body's kind of adjusted over the period. Um, how far from the historical norm it is as opposed to just an absolute level of temperature so that, you know, um, a 95 degree day in British Columbia is more punishing than a 115 day degree day in, um, in Delhi. Um, whether the infrastructure is built to retain heat or distribute heat, whether there's air conditioning, what other kind of cooling practices can be introduced, what kind of cultural adaptations are possible, whether people can change their daily rhythms for a week if things are really hot or whether they feel obligated to stick to the, you know, the ritual of going to work in the same way or whatever. Um, and you know, that's not to say that there's no risk of heat death from climate change. In fact, last summer, I think the number was 60,000 Europeans died of, of heat death, um, heat stress last, just last summer, in a summer that was not considered, you know, a historic, exceptional heat event. It, I mean, it was hot, it was quite hot, but it was, people talk about the 2003 and the 2010 European heat waves, this didn't match up, and yet you had 60,000 people dying. It's just to say that anytime you try to apply a simplistic or, um, uh, you know, back of the envelope kind of a rule to the way the climate will be affecting us, almost invariably you're brushing aside all of these complexities, which are start literally at the individual physiological level, like whether this population's bodies is used to heat or not, but passes all the way up through social organization, infrastructure, politics, um, and even, you know, in a certain sense, geopolitics, since that shapes so much of what goes down on, uh, goes down on the ground as well. And we, you know, as we're entering into a phase of, a climatic phase, um, an era of environmental history that is defined by these disruptions and these changes, probably we should try to get a lot more sophisticated about exactly how they're interacting with our own lives, rather than just trusting that, like, the model that some modeler drew up like 20 years ago at Princeton or whatever is gonna be an exact prediction of the way that we'll all live 20 years from now. Um, and I think we're, we're, many of us learning that a little bit intuitively, 
um, because we are living through disasters that seemed horrifying to us a few years ago and finding a way to navigate them, even if it also involves tuning out from some of that suffering. Um, but I think there's probably some larger scale conceptual shift that it would be nice to affect where um, yeah, we don't think about the future as being so predictably programmed by computers or supercomputers um, and actually designed and lived and suffered through by people as complex as they and their institutions are. Uh, yeah, two things to add there. Uh, one is that in, this, in, uh, in relation to this question of uh, temperature tolerance, one does have to be very careful because, uh, you know, uh, there, there used to be, in the 19th century, for example, this whole racist uh, uh, discourse about how, uh, you know, Africans and Asians uh, can tolerate, uh, you know, greater, he uh, greater uh, heat and so on. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with race at all. It just is a question of what you're exposed to. Uh, you know, over your lifetimes. So, for example, whenever, uh, you know, often when I go to a, a university campus or something, or even go to the park in winter, I'm amazed by all these young Americans who are basically, uh, you know, wandering around in their underwear. Uh, whereas I would be frozen stiff if I, you know, took off my uh, heavy jacket. In the same way, it is true that those of us who grow up in hot countries, uh, we learn certain coping me mechanisms. For example, we never walk on the sunny side of the street. You know, it just comes automatically. You just switch, uh, you know. Uh, there are so many other ways in which you learn to adapt. And in the U.S., I mean, we literally talk about that as like a, a mark of your temperament. Yes. You're somebody who walks on the sunny side of the street. I mean, we sing songs about it. It's, you know, it's, it's something to celebrate, not to yeah, live in fear. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the second thing is exactly this, uh, social organization. Uh, you'll remember in 2003 when um, the, the European heat wave, when uh, I think it was 100 to 150,000 people died. Uh, but later, when, you, uh, when they did studies of it, almost all of these people were elderly, isolated, living in isolated flats. They've actually done studies uh, in Chicago uh, of similar neighborhoods with the same uh, sort of income levels. And they found that neighborhoods that were more cohesive, where people checked on each other and helped each other, uh, those neighborhoods had much lower rates of death, uh, of heat-related deaths. Yeah, I think in France it was also often the case that the children had gone on holiday and left their parents behind in their flats, typically unair conditioned, which is you know a reminder that however much we think of the individual human as the autonomous unit of our society, in fact, we're you know stitched together in all of these ways to everyone around us, and the more stitched together we are, the, the healthier and more stable and, yeah, safe will be. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you, uh, you know, we can see this uh, across the board that, in fact, the ways in which uh, adaptation and mitigation occur can be so very different. Uh, and uh, to be honest, at this point in time, I've stopped uh, really even trying to think about, uh, you know, uh, the wider figures uh, is, uh, you know, can we can we find uh, technological solutions to all these issues? And I find myself much more interested in uh, in uh, local level strategies of ad um, of adaptation, local level strategies of mitigation, because again, it gives you some sense of agency in relation to a problem, which is which often can deprive you of any sense of agency. Yeah, I mean, it might say something about where I come from and how I was raised that I do find myself falling back on a lot of those same figures, those same frameworks that you're talking about. And I do think about the sort of, the different way that scientists talk about the medium term future, the long term future, and have tried to incorporate that into my understanding of the climate. And, um, you know, just to shorthand, to briefly go through that, it's, you know, it does, you know, most people now talk about a climate future um, where we have maybe twice as much warming as we have today. Um, we could get a little lucky, could get a little unlucky, but we used to be talking about climate futures that were three or four times what we have today. And so there is some reason for, you know, if what you're doing is comparing possible futures, there is some reason for, you know, to be grateful about that improvement that we may have cut our expected warming in half in just a few years as a result of a global awakening and investment in renewables and, and all the rest of it. But it's also the case that standing from the vantage of today, the thing we know for sure 
is that things are gonna get warmer and messier and more complicated, um, even despite the action that's now being taken. Um, we don't really know where that will all lead, but we do know, no matter what we do, the world is going to be disrupted more 10 years from now than it is now, and more 20 years from now than it is 10 years from now. And that really does sort of pull the focus back to what are we gonna do about it? Um, but since you mentioned agency, I, I wanted to ask you generally how you think about agency in the context of the climate crisis. I mean, you know, again, I, I'm thinking so much about this lately in terms of um, the Canadian fires, but there's something really quite um, distressing about exactly what we're watching unfold here, which is to say, you know, Canada has carbon responsibility. Um, it's a very high per capita emitter, but it is not singularly responsible for the state of its forests um, or the warming of its forests, I should say. It has um, embraced forest policies that have made those forests more flammable, but again, there are large climate forcings here that are beyond the scope of Canadian control. Even if Canada was a person who could single-handedly decide we're gonna do our forest management this way as opposed to this way. Even so, the dynamics are outside the realm of you know, Canadian responsibility. And then you think about how intimidating it is to think of all of the things we need to change to reduce our emissions and stabilize the world's temperatures, all the changes we need to make to our power systems, to our transportation, to the way they eat, the way that we build cities, um, the, you know, the way that we do industry, the way that buy our clothes, all of that needs to change. And then you think about the fires doing more damage to the future of the planet this year than all of those other things combined. And how can you get a handle on that? I mean, it's, you know, maybe you can imagine, okay, we're gonna aggressively decarbonize. We're gonna go all electric in our cars. We're gonna, you know, go all solar and wind with our, with our power. You can tell a story where political change brings about, say, a net zero Canada. But if the fires are still burning, and they're burning at such a scale that it towers above all of the contributions being made to the problem of the climate crisis today by those industrial activities, it does start to make you feel really small. And um, you know, powerless is probably too strong a word, but disempowered, um, even if you are coming at this with great swaggering confidence. So how do you think about agency how do you think about, you know, people ask all the time, what can I do, what can I do? Um, how do you think about the question of agency, the problem of agency as it relates to this global challenge? Well, the first and most obvious thing is pay attention, you know? Just look at where you live. Just look at where, you know, uh, uh, all around you and try and understand whether this, uh, uh, this, system that you're in, whether it's hospitable for you or not. And I, what really amazes me is the degree to which people don't do that. You know, uh, the fastest growing city uh, uh, in the United States is Phoenix, Arizona, a city that literally cannot exist without air conditioning. You know, I mean, before, before the invention of uh, um, air conditioning, that is basically the 1940s on with, not invention, but rather the widespread use of air conditioning, uh, there was no city there, you know. Then the city began to grow, and it's been growing faster and faster. And who are the people who are moving there? They're retirees, mainly. You know, so you have all these elderly people who are extremely vulnerable moving into this incredibly a heat exposed place now just imagine in a city like uh, in a city like phoenix suppose you have uh, an interruption in the in your utilities in electricity which could very easily happen because it's happened in texas if it were to happen in the same way just imagine 10 hours in uh, in arizona during a heat wave when you have uh, let's say 110 degree temperatures or whatever which they had for a full month straight exactly this summer yeah yeah, I mean, you said in one of your articles that the uh, sidewalks, uh, the temperature goes up to what, 190 or something? Yeah, there were people who were fainting from heat stroke and being burned when they hit the pavement. And the burn units in the Phoenix hospitals were filling up as a result. But, I mean, 
you know, our, our mutual friend Jeff Goodell wrote a, a book in which he, he mentions um, the possibility that there would be a, um, a, a power outage in such a heat wave. And scientists modeling that say that as much as half of the city might have to visit the emergency room. I mean, just... I mean, it's crazy. And, I mean, those people who are moving there are taking decisions con uh, consciously to go to that place. I mean, what, uh, what are they thinking of? You know, it's impossible to imagine. Similarly, the, another incredibly fast-growing city, Miami. You know, already now you have sunny day floods in Miami. Which are the parts of Miami that are most vulnerable, let's say, to a major hurricane? It's the parts that, are, you know, face the sea directly. These are the most expensive bits of real estate in America now. You know, people want to live there where you know that one day the sea is, uh, the sea is going to come and, uh, you know, invade what you think is, uh, uh, is yours. And we, we know that those invasions of salt water are happening on, on a massive scale. Remember that building that collapsed? It was because salt water had invaded, uh, you know, uh, intruded into, into, uh, in, uh, into the soil. So Miami is one, but if you look around the world, you'll see endless numbers of cities of this kind. And the curious thing is, many of these cities actually date back to the expansion of, uh, uh, of colonialism. So Bombay is a very good example. Uh, Bombay was basically six islands. Uh, over since the 18th century, these six islands have become a kind of peninsula jutting out into the ocean. One of the effects of climate change is that uh, uh, hurricanes are intensifying uh, in the Arabian Sea. Bombay literally faces the sea. Uh, you know, uh, New York actually has a barrier island, but uh, Bombay doesn't. So if a major cyclone were to come up uh, the Arabian Sea and hit Bombay, which it definitely will, there have been two uh, near misses in recent years uh, um, already. This city will be just completely devastated. Uh, I've, I was just in Hong Kong uh, uh, last week. Hong Kong was actually hit by, uh, uh, by a typhoon a few days before I went there. Uh, Hong Kong has very high building standards because they were hit by two major um, uh, typhoons in 1906 and 1937 where they lost a lot of people, but they, uh, they, they, they put in very rigorous uh, uh, building uh, regulations. So now they're, uh, you know, they're very rarely affected. Bombay has none of that. If Bombay were to be hit by a major cyclone, which it absolutely will be, uh, you can't even speculate about how many people, um, uh, you know, basically would die. Uh, because the best thing you can do when uh, a cyclone hits is evacuate. Bombay is almost impossible to evacuate. There are only two, uh, two roads, which are almost always jam-packed with traffic, uh, that lead to the mainland. And Bombay has this other vulnerability. It has two, uh, two major nuclear plants on either side of it. So, you know, the concentration of risk that, uh, that exists in some of these cities, it's, uh, uh, it's truly horrifying. That's all you can say. And it's, you know, y you were suggesting there, you know, there's a lot that goes into building up that risk, our choice to build where we build, you know, in the deep history of the human species, people did not live on the coasts, just in general. That's a, a pretty modern invention. Um, but also, you know, particular choices about, for instance, where to, where to build a nuclear plant. Um, but in addition to making these threats that faced by that infrastructure and faced by that development more intense, climate change is also just scrambling them. The weather patterns aren't exactly what we had come to expect or come to count on over previous generations. And so you might confidently say, well, we're not going to, we, you know, in the 100 year record, we haven't seen this kind of a storm in this kind of a place, therefore we're safe. Um, much less of a safe bet now. Um, and speaking of nuclear plants, I mean, we saw in France last summer, they actually had to turn off a bunch of plants because the water was too hot to cool off the, the fuel. The local rivers had heated up too much. Um, they dried out and heated up too much and they couldn't be used to, um, to cool off the, um, the fuel. And so they had to turn them off. Um, we're, you know, there's similar issues with great hydropower plants that have been built over the last century where, you know, on, on the expectation of certain levels of, of rainfall that are no longer present. But of course, even places that um, are not used to so much rain, we're now seeing a lot more rain. Um, and we're seeing that, I mean, it almost seems to me in this summer, the most vivid um, images of, of um, 
extreme weather this summer have all been rainstorms and been you know great deluges in China, um, across Europe. Um, really just regularly now it feels like I'm looking at images on my social media feed of um, towns and cities that looked quite formidable, uh, modern, totally overrun by water, deep into subway stations and carrying people away down the street or pushing cars down the roads. Um, and, you know, it seems like an easy thing to, you know, it seems like an easy thing to say, okay, we're going to have a wetter future. We can build for that. We can plan for it. But the actual work involved in redesigning the way that we live um, everywhere on the planet is so mind-bendingly large. And it's critical work, as you were saying earlier. You know, it allows us some amount of agency. But it is also quite intimidating on its own. Uh, yeah, but again, you know, I think one thing that we have to be very careful about is what uh, you might call uh, climate reductionism. You know, that is reducing everything to uh, the climate impacts. Because actually, as my friend Margaret Atwood famously said, it's not just climate change, it's everything change. You know, so there are many other kinds of crises unfolding simultaneously. Uh, bio biodiversity loss, uh, you know, mass migrations, uh, extinctions, so, uh, racial conflicts, if you like. So there are just so many vectors of, of this planetary crisis that we are in that we should not, I think, um, uh, zero in ab solely upon climate, which is increasingly happening, you know, uh, because now if you attach climate to any kind of funding proposal, you're much more likely to get it. Uh, and, uh, you know, people have started doing that. A very good paper ca came out on a book, actually, on Bangladesh, you know. Uh, Bangladesh is actually a very vulnerable country, but it's also admirable. It's also a climate leader in the sense that uh, they've been uh, very good at educating their public about climate and, you know, talking about climate issues and so on. So, again, to go back to the numbers, uh, you know, to that sort of numerical way of looking at uh, uh, these problems, uh, you know, the clim climate scientists will tell you, oh, well, Bangladesh is gone. It, um, it'll be lost in, um, you know, so many years because of sea level rise and so on. Uh, what they don't recognize is that, in fact, the Bengal Delta, uh, uh, you know, this is formed out of an incredible amount of silt carried down from the Himalaya. Uh, by the Ganges and the, Bam and the Brahmaputra, much, much more even than the Amazon, the amount of silt that's, uh, that's brought into the Bengal Delta. So it's always been an interplay of land and water. And in the past, people knew how to interact, you know, with the, uh, with the land and water in such a way that during one season you withdrew, and in another season you went back because, you know, uh, the sort of mud flats that emerge are incredibly uh, fertile. So at some point, uh, someone decided that because Holland can be defended by dikes and embankments, Bangladesh must also be defended by dikes and embankments. So they went around building these dikes and embankments. And uh, you know, a lot, of, uh, um, uh, a lot of NGOs and things got massive funding to do this. They brought in European experts and so on. Of course, but what they forgot is that European rivers carry less than 1% of the silt that's carried by the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. It's impossible to stop that flow of water because what happens is that if you try to do that, the river just rises and creates an even worse inundation. So, you know, I think it's very important to remember, to try and recall the memory of the land, so to speak, you know, and not to reduce all these things solely to, uh, to issues of climate. Similarly, you know, you mentioned these terrible floods in Libya. The problem with these floods was, par was partly that uh, there were these uh, uh, three or four upstream dams which were not working, uh, uh, working in unison. And the reason for that is because uh, NATO, in its infinite wisdom, uh, decided to bomb Libya back to the Stone Age. Uh, it destroyed all state structures there, uh, which included uh, meteorological structures so that there were no early warnings. I mean, what NATO did in Libya is one of the craziest things that's, you know, it, it's just unimaginable because they have literally created this incredible migration problem for themselves, and it's only going to intensify. So, you know, we can't read these events, uh, these terrible disasters, without accounting for, often it's politics, geopolitics, planning, you know. <laughs>
So where do you start in your analysis? I mean, if you don't want climate change to be the center of the story, how do you, what's your sort of first touchstone in talking about all of these dynamics? Uh, there, I think we really have to learn from the way that uh, indigenous people think, you know, which is that when you, when you come to a place, you have to first try to understand what it is, what makes that a place. You know, I wouldn't in any way underplay, uh, you know, the importance of, um, um, of, of climate change. But climate change is the greater envelope, you know, within which... Uh, these disasters happen and within which these changes are occurring. And these changes, I think, cannot be understood without paying attention to the history, without paying attention to the landscape, without paying attention to the ways in which people used to inhabit that land um, at a certain point. Yeah, I, I often sort of make a similar point when I, I talk about, um, you know, m there are many ways of measuring how much the planet's already changed, but the thing that stands out in my mind is um, the fact that Houston has had five 500 year storms in a five year period. And then I try to think about, you know, what, what that really means. I mean, a 500 year storm, it's a, it's a kind of a mislead, you know, it's a, it's a vernacular idea. It's not exactly a scientific idea, but the basic idea is like, this is a storm we'd expect to hit once every five centuries. And five centuries ago, there were no European people in North America. Um, five centuries ago, Um, sorry, um, is there another one that maybe could be like brought up? Or, um, I'll try to go on a long rant so you can. Um, uh, uh, um, 500 years ago, you know, Hernando Cortez had just landed in Mexico. So we're talking about a storm that you'd expect to hit once during that entire history. And forgive me for giving this as an American centered, a US centered view, but uh, story. But we're talking about a, a storm that we'd expect to hit once um, during the history of American colonial settlement, the building of colonies, um, you know, the waging of a genocide, the fighting of multiple wars against the native peoples, um, the fighting of a revolution, the building of a slave empire, the fighting of a civil war, the period of industrialization, World War I, World War II, the American empire, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, the end of history, um, September 11th, the financial crisis, COVID-19, we're talking about a storm that we would expect to hit once during that entire period, and Houston was hit by five of them in five years. So we're literally seeing meteorologically several millennia of extreme weather um, hitting one city over the course of half a decade. That's how much disruption is being compressed and forced onto the city of Houston. And yet, Houston's still standing. <laughs> you know, they've suffered through those storms. Um, I don't want to downplay that. But it wasn't wiped off the map. Um, they're trying to figure out their future there. Um, but it's not the case that those millions of people are all fleeing or dying. Um, they're trying to navigate the new landscape in which they live. Um, I think in some ways not learning the lessons that you're talking about. I mean, they're trying to build a big dike that <laughs> like, protects the city. Um, but in other ways, they are learning some of those lessons, learning that some of the development that they've did over the last few decades is not sustainable, that um, some of the, you know, especially in the, in the marshland is, you know, some of that should be turned back over um, and allowed to flood a little bit more naturally rather than um, piling up on concrete, as is often the case. Um, and the lesson for that, of that to me is, really in a, at, a, at a big picture level, that as totally transformed as um, the natural landscape of the world is, um, has been already by climate change, it is just the natural landscape on which we will build a human future. And to what degree that human future is successful um, by any metric you choose to develop or implement has to do with um, what we learn, what we are learning, what we have learned um, about how to live on this planet. And, you know, climate change um, is telling us that the way that we have been living in many parts of the world is not workable or sustainable. Um, but that doesn't mean that it will be the end of us either. It'll just make the board game that we're all playing together um, a lot more challenging and 
where we come out on the other side is, you know, a matter for human undertaking. Um, but what I want to ask you about more pointedly is, you know, that's a kind of a generic point about the, the planet um, and the way that we all relate to the future. But how do you think about this, particularly in terms of today's geopolitics and the divisions between um, particularly the wealthy countries of the world and, and the less wealthy country parts of the world. Um, in, in, the, in the climate universe, as I see it, there's been a sort of upswelling of um, interest in the plight of um, the poor countries of the world over the last few decades. Climate diplomats pay more lip service to that. Um, but we're still very far from anything like um, an equal playing field. And especially when you think about even the need of the need to build renewables or spend on adaptation, the cost of those projects in the global south is much, much higher than it is in the global north, um, even though it is those countries who have much less of that money to pay for it. Um, and of course, there are many other facets and dynamics to this um, system than just the financial one. But you know, tell me a little bit how you see um, our current geopolitics, the divisions between um, the countries of the world playing into the near-term story of, of climate? Well, uh, it's hard to know where to begin. But you know, really, one of the most important divides in the world today is between the way that climate change is conceived of uh, in the global north, where it's basically seen as a techno-scientific problem that can be addressed uh, through various kinds of technological issues and so on, uh, and the Global South, uh, where it's uh, really seen as a geopolitical issue. You know, so if you ask uh, any person in the Global South, uh, well, uh, you know, you are very directly uh, vulnerable uh, because of climate change. Don't you think you should uh, shrink your carbon footprint? I once did this, actually. In, uh, I asked some farmers in a very interesting part of uh, the world, which is... Uh, uh, the Malaccas, that's eastern Indonesia, in this little island called Tidore, which once upon a time in history was incredibly rich and prosperous because it was the only place in the world where clove trees grew. So they were incredibly prosperous and so on. And then, of course, the Dutch came and conquered them and destroyed everything. But uh, so, uh, so they still grow, they still grow clove trees on Tidore. Uh, but the clove trees are dying because of climate change. And I asked many of the farmers, you know, who you can imagine how terrible it is for them to see this tree that made their, literally their tree of life, uh, dying in front of their eyes. And I asked them, I said, don't you think you should shrink your carbon footprint? Every single person there to, told me exactly what I had heard in a, anywhere in India, anywhere in China, Indonesia, you ask this question and they'll say, why should I shrink my carbon footprint? They should shrink their carbon footprint. Because in any case, my carbon footprint is a fraction of theirs. And they got rich when we were poor and weak. Now it's our turn. You know, so immediately, it's... Well, can I just jump in there for a second? You say fraction. I mean, I think most people don't truly appreciate just how grotesque the differences here are. So the average resident of Mali has a carbon footprint that is smaller than the average British tea kettle. Yes. <laughs> yes. The average resident of Nigeria, which is a relatively prosperous African country, um, it's not, a, not among the poorest. Um, the average resident of Nigeria has a carbon footprint that's smaller than the average American refrigerator. Um, and all told, through history, all of sub-Saharan Africa has produced only um, a couple of percent of global emissions. So. You know, we're talking about some really, really dramatic inequalities here. You know, just calling it a fraction almost like minimizes the difference. But it is, you can imagine being on the on the on the short end of that stick and just being horrified and outraged by the suggestion that there's any carbon responsibility on your shoulders. Uh, absolutely, but I think it's very interesting that you see immediately, you know, uh, the difference between um, a, a northern perspective you know, and uh, perspective from the global south. And, uh, you know, uh, we all often talk about the relationship between uh, em emissions uh, and lifestyle, but there's also a very powerful correlation between uh, emissions and power. Uh, 
you know, in the sense of military power, because uh, militaries, uh, they're one of the high, highest emitting institutions in the world. So again, you know, there's an absolute determination on the part of people in the global south that never again uh, will we allow ourselves to be colonized. And often these, um, uh, these uh, calls for reducing the carbon footprint are literally seen as uh, forms of colonialism. I think we just have a few minutes before we're going to start doing um, audience Q&A. Um, before we get to that, maybe one last subject is, how do you see these perspectives um, changing? I mean, um, do you see any progress in integrating the perspective of, say, you know, um, folks in Indonesia into the folks in Geneva? Um, or are we still talking entirely past each other, um, not just at, say, climate conferences, but also um, in our cultural lives and our private lives? Are, are we, is there any way that you see that climate change is teaching us about our common humanity and shared fate and teaching us to listen to one another? Or is it all, you know, self-interest and a narrow blinkered perspective? Uh, it's a divide, it's a, you know, a very divided story. On the one hand, you know, you mentioned about, uh, you said something about, uh, you know, the world paying uh, a lip service to uh, helping poorer nations and so on. But, you know, uh, uh, that fund that was set up uh, during COP26 in Par uh, the Paris Agreement, that never received you know, even a tenth of the funding. It was meant to have $100 billion each year. It never even received 10, uh, 10 billion. And just to put that number in perspective, last year, the EU as a whole spent a trillion dollars on fossil fuel subsidies because, I mean, they're not doing that every year. They were doing that because they were having an energy crisis because of the invasion of Ukraine. But they spent, in a single year, 10 times as much money subsidizing fossil fuels as was promised by the global north to the global south every year in terms of climate adaptation and mitigation funding. Uh, so, um, uh, exactly. And, uh, you know, it was always said, oh, the money isn't there, we don't have the money. But as soon as this, uh, as this conflict started, Immediately, we saw, we saw, you know, spending on armaments go up to the point where, what, well, it's now, uh, within one year, the, it's gone up by a trillion or something. So, you know, this is the problem. I mean, that uh, a lot of what is said about climate change, mitigation, etc., is actually just lip service. On the other hand, it is also true that uh, uh, youth movements, ordinary people, uh, NGOs, lots of voluntary organizations are building, uh, are building bridges with each other across the world. And for all we know, uh, you know, they could generate enough momentum to actually force, uh, you know, the whole world uh, to come to some sort of equitable understanding. Well, on that hopeful note, should we move to <laughs> audience conversation? Is there, a, I don't know the format, is there? No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. So Thank you so much, David Amitav. This is in incredibly fascinating and rich. Uh, while we figure out the other mic, I'll ask uh, people who would like to ask questions to just line up behind this mic. Uh, and I think they're fixing the other one. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation. I just um, worry a lot that we don't target our wrath and our anger at the right people. The individuals really, as, as you said, uh, are, um, have no power. They are powerless, the individuals. Those who have the power are the oligarchs who have hijacked our governments. These are the culprits. These are the villains. And instead of targeting them, we target individuals. I don't think it's, it's right. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I, I would say our, our, certainly in the US and Canada, our governments are uh, captured by some powerful rich people. And many of them are very friendly to the fossil fuel industry. And that's one big reason why we are not moving nearly as fast as we need to. Um, you know, 
on the particular question of climate villainy, I think things are a little bit complicated by the sense that many of us also enjoy the benefits of fossil fuels, and we um, sometimes don't want to acknowledge that. We've benefited historically from growth powered by fossil fuels. Um, we don't want to think about what that means about our debts towards the rest of the world, the debts that we've accrued in generating our own wealth, but are now imposing in terms of climate damages elsewhere. And I think it's, um, you know, I think both things um, are, should be a part of a proper kind of res accounting of responsibility and villainy, which is to say, we do not have truly democratic societies. If we did, we would have much more climate forward policy, but it's also the case that to some degree we vote with our, um, with our wallets and we're kind of happy eating a lot of carbon. The problem is that um, there was a study of all the emissions in the world, I think it was published by the Guardian newspaper, I forget who did the study, but they said that 100 companies are responsible for all the fossil fuel emissions in the world, 100 companies, so why not target these 100 companies? Well, you know, I actually published a piece today about the fact that I think the climate movement, the global climate movement, um, the climate, even the climate establishment is turning against the fossil fuel companies in a more focused confrontational way than has been the case in the past. And so a few years ago, you would hear from climate diplomats, you'd hear from all the prime ministers and politicians, and they would, you know, they would say, we need to transition, we need to decarbonize, but they would avoid really focusing on, um, on fossil fuel companies. And over the last year especially, that's really begun to change quite dramatically. It's still mostly a rhetorical shift. It's not truly um, a policy shift. We're not taking measures to limit the production of fossil fuels as we need to to hit even our less ambitious climate goals. But there's something shifting in the wind about the rhetoric of responsibility. And I think um, many people who a few years ago were quite uncomfortable confronting the fossil fuel business are growing much more um, staunch in their criticism. And um, I personally was really struck a week or two ago by the fact that um, California uh, is now suing all of the big oil companies. Um, for a, a number of things, d deceptive practices, but they're also trying to build a, a, a many billion dollar fund um, for, di to distrib for, for collecting on damages to distribute. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is, you know, people have filed lawsuits against big oil before, but California is a um, adversary of a very different scale. It's the, technically it's like the fourth biggest economy in the world. Um, and Gavin Newsom, who's not in my mind a perfect politician, but was like very excited to be playing um, the role of, of um, climate critic very publicly. And I, on that point, I do think that some of the, you know, some of the changes in the air here. Um, we'll see where it leads. We'll see how successful that effort, those efforts are. But I do think, in general, it's no longer the people who are just on the climate protests who are yelling at the fossil fuel companies. It's increasingly people in positions of kind of establishmentarian power, and I, I do think that that's probably a mark of progress. So, Daniel Bada, and thank you very much for being here today. Um, my question is regarding nuclear energy as a transitional measure. I'd like to find out where you're at regarding that kind of analysis and that particular option. Um, well, I wouldn't think of nuclear really as a transition energy. I think there's a case that we may want to use it forever. Um, I don't think there's a, a reason to believe that we'll only need it for a short period of time. Um, the benefits that it offers in comparison to renewables um, are that the energy it provides is stable. Um, the plants last for a much longer time than a, than a solar cell does. Um, and I think in general, um, we have, as a culture, sort of overhyped the risks of, of um, nuclear power, which has killed in all of its history, all of the meltdowns in history, um, fewer people than die every day from the pollution from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, but I also don't think that it's a easy solution or obvious solution um, in the sense that it's very expensive, um, mm -hmm. in the sense that it takes a very long time to build those plants, um, and in the sense that, um, you know, it, the technology is sensitive enough that um, 
you know, it's can be to some degree dangerous in the hands of people who want to weaponize it. Um, and so my own view of nuclear is that, I'm interested to hear Amitav's perspective, but my own view of nuclear power is that um, it probably should be talked about a little bit more um, openly among climate advocates and people who are planning for a climate future. Um, but it's not like a silver bullet cure-all where we just hit the nuclear button and we, and we, we all head home having won the, won the war. Um, well, I'm not opposed to nuclear power in principle, uh, but I have a friend who actually teaches uh, um, at the University of British Columbia who's an uh, expert, he's a physicist and an expert on nuclear power. And what he says is that, in fact, there are two problems. One is that if you're going to try and think of meeting the world's energy needs from nuclear power, you would need to build like uh, one nuclear plant every day for like years to come. Secondly, it's again a problem of externalization. That is, you know, the problem is not whether it kills people now, but what do we do with the waste? And the waste is, is the real issue because the waste can't be disposed of at scale. You know, so there are these other cautionary notes. So I think it's as with other, you know, with other issues of uh, substituting other forms of energy. Uh, you know, it's not like uh, renewable energy doesn't have uh, costs you know, very heavy environmental costs. So, you know, what we really need to be talking about, and the only person in the world talking about it is Pope Francis, hmm. uh, is we have to really talk about changing our ways of life. And I'm sorry to say that I think often this talk about uh, uh, renewable energy and so on, uh, it's just another form of externalization. It's just a way of keeping an unsustainable way of life going for a little bit longer. Thank you. I want to thank you both and uh, speak to both of you bringing up agency and local involvement. One of the only ideas about climate change and moving forward that has given me any sense of personal agency is the Thousand Cities Initiative, which uh, states that if a thousand cities around the world adopted Paris Climate Accord standards, the world could still meet its global emissions targets. And there's so much uh, sense of personal agency in this. And I also, in a room full of artists, I find this really inspiring because imagine a dollar from every show at the Bell Center here in Montreal going towards local initiatives, children at schools being able to participate in things that, um, that actually you know, contributed to this thing that is conceivably achievable at a local scale. So I have two questions pertaining to this for you both. One being, um, do you know of similar such initiatives? I've heard that Santa Barbara is doing some really innovative things vis-a-vis um, -vis funding some kinds of things like this. And the second question is, um, I think in terms of doing this, there's something really exciting about saying, Montreal is signing up for this Thousand Cities initiative, and then maybe that inspires Boston. You know, Maybe that inspires Mumbai, other, other places in the world, and it's a beautiful idea that can move forward. But um, doing those kinds of things as well um, can create flashpoints and points of political contact, uh, you know, conflict and as much pushback as they, they do moving things forward. So I guess just um, those questions around that idea. Uh I absolutely welcome initiatives like that. I think ordinary people, artists, uh, etc., joining hands across the world have a lot to contribute. But you know, the problem really with, this, uh, with cities, again, is that uh, the importance of real estate lobbies. You know, if you go to cities everywhere around the world, that's really the problem. I mean, it's a problem with Miami, it's a problem with uh, Phoenix, Arizona, it's a problem with, uh, uh, with Bombay, because the real, it's the real estate lobbies that insist on building in the wrong places. You know, for example, in Houston, that's the real problem that uh, in many parts of Houston are untouched. The parts uh, that, that were devastated are the parts that were where they insisted on building on floodplains. And you see this around the world. You see it in Houston, you see it in um, Chennai, uh, in India. And more and more real estate companies do this and they are politically so powerful that they can, uh, they can actually force the government to not issue risk warnings. So in Miami, for example, uh, uh, realtors aren't allowed to show their clients risk warnings. 
So I think it's very important to remember that, you know, just as a fossil fuel companies are major criminals in all, all of this, I, concrete, which is the second most uh, polluting uh, substance, the concrete lobbies are incredibly powerful. We see this in India now. Uh, every time a dam is proposed, it's passed almost immediately. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it goes up now because uh, what is a dam? It's just a vast little, vast wall of concrete. And it's because of the power of the concrete lobby, you know, and the power of these real estate lobbies. So, really, as far as cities are concerned, the most important thing to do with any kind of coalition of people is to identify who are the enemies, you know, these, that's these developers and realtors, and try to constrain them, you know. I think there is some, also some hopeful action on the adaptation side at the city level um, in many parts of the world. You see a lot more attention being paid to what's called the urban heat island effect, where cities are considerably hotter, and some um, effort being taken in certain places to plant trees, to, um, you know, revise building codes um, to make those places safer. It's not a wholesale structural change of the kind that Amitav is ta talking about. There's still going to be real estate lobbies and real estate firms building into really dangerous places. But I do think that there's a kind of a growing recognition among um, urban leaders the world over that the city can be um, a site of adaptation experiment. And um, I hope that some of those interventions play out usefully and, and protect local populations. Um, we were talking before backstage about um, uh, about cars, and I do think we're seeing, a, we will see over the next half decade or decade, an interesting kind of a culture war play out about like who do cities belong to? Do they belong to cars? Do they belong to bikes? Do they belong to people? Um, probably answered in different ways in different parts of the world. Um, but there are some places, especially in Europe, that have um, taken some really meaningful measures to redesign the landscape of their cities to make them safer and also more pleasant and also cooler all at the same time, um, in addition to reducing their emissions because there are fewer cars going through them. So I'd like to see that sort of um, perspective and approach grow and expand. Um, it's not an easy fight to win in a place like the US or in parts of Canada, in fact, but um, I do think that there are, there are places at the city level that are you know, moving in the right direction in some interesting ways too. Hi, um, thank you both for this conversation. I think in listening to stuff like this, what always comes to mind is we're talking about things like agency and the ability to find funding that's promised and like a way to kind of get through the like increasing disasters as sometimes paying a little bit less attention. And I think what always comes back to me is this like eternal bind of like messaging about the climate where's that balance between alarmist and the point we've just become apathetic to all of it. And I think both of you like having written books on the climate crisis aimed more at the general public. As people who like do that work in science communication, how do you find that balance between apathy and alarmist um, that still incites action without kind of getting to the point of overwhelm where you don't do anything or think that you have a role to play in all of this? Well, I, th I wonder, we may have somewhat different answers to this, so well, maybe we'll both um, take a crack at it, but um, you know, when I think about this question, first of all, um, I honestly think that what I'm doing is less um, about motivating a particular action and more about describing the world as it's changing. Um, and I like to think that people can do with that information what they will. And I imagine that many people will find that motivating in certain ways. Um, but it's not the first order job that I give myself in, in writing. Other people feel differently. Other people, um, you know, uh, Bill McKibben thinks of himself as an activist first and a writer second. Um, I happen to come at it from a different perspective and think of myself really first as a writer. Um, but I'm also a writer who um, made uh, his mark through climate alarmism. And so I've thought a lot about these questions over the last few years. And honestly, and there's a lot of talk in the climate world about exactly the dilemma that you raise. Like, how can you, um, how can you talk about the scale of the challenge without turning people off and pushing them into fatalism or despair? 
and a lot of worry about the mental health effects of talking in apocalyptic terms about our future, our shared future. And I think in certain ways those concerns are, are valid. But I also think if I'm taking the position of a political campaigner and assessing the state of the world's concern over climate, it just seems blindingly obvious to me that complacency is the problem, not despair. And I think that we don't need to tell stories any one way. Alarmism is not the only way to talk about climate change. Certainly there are many things to describe that are not apocalyptic. But I do think if you're, if you're thinking about turning the dial one way or the, or the other, I'm much more concerned about complacency than I am about um, fatalism and despair. And I, I, I just don't look, I don't look out at a world that is beset with people who've already given up about climate. I look out at a world full of people who haven't yet woken up to the scale of the changes that we're seeing. And so to the extent that I'm trying to calibrate that, I may be a little bit more willing to, you know, to write in alarmist language than some others. Um, but I also think more broadly, um, that everybody is going to come to the story in different ways and have different perspectives based on where they're from and their own temperament and their mood on the day that they're reading a story. And the idea that we could somehow precisely tune our message to meet the precise person who needs to hear that precise thing to get them to get up and go to the precise right rally to you know make the change the precise right bill in the precise right way to save the world. It's just it's such a game of pachinko. Um, and I know myself that there are days when I'm really sensitive to, when I'm really hopeful, when I'm really despairing. There are days when I'm really angry. There are days when I'm, um, you know, just marveling at the majesty of the change. That, you know, I have so many different ways into this story, and I think that's true of everyone. And I don't think we should be, um, patro as, as, as like communicators, as storytellers, I don't think we should be patronizing to the public and tell them that there's only one way to understand this story or only one place to find themselves in it and instead do the best that we can to um, document what is happening at the climato climatological level but also at the political level and also at the individual level and trust that... Um, to some extent, that well-meaning people will um, will do the right thing with that information. Uh, I completely um, agree with uh, with David on most of this. Actually, I must say, what really astonishes me is the degree to which, uh, within the climate community, so to speak, uh, people fight over the meanings of uh, you know alarmism, doomism, optimism, and so on. Uh, and they'll all cite uh, some some uh, some study that's been <laughs> done somewhere showing that if people are too worried, then they won't do anything, uh, or. Someone else will cite another study saying that if they're too worried, yes, they'll get up and be active or whatever. I mean, how can you possibly determine those things? I mean, uh, anyone who showed me such a study, I would be extremely skeptical of it. You know, we know those studies are essentially produced by the kinds of questions you ask. So, look, if this is genuinely the biggest thing that our species has ever confronted, then obviously everyone will have a different feeling about it. And everyone must be free to say, uh, you know, what they feel. And again, as David says, uh, you know, in most cases, people will, uh, uh, simply because they are concerned, they, they are going to do something about it, maybe in one way or another. But what I think is absolutely inadmissible is for anyone to try and dictate one line on this story. I mean, that's just, that's just a hopeless endeavor. You know, you're never going to get that kind of one line. Everyone are telling the same story about this. We have a question on this side. Uh, the mic is working now. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I, I have a sense that when we talk about climate change and climate crises, uh, we always seem to aim towards either infrastructure and systematic change or individual change, which I'm not saying is not a good thing. I think it's important. But I know you spoke a little bit about it during your talk, and I was wondering if you could kind of expand on what you think of communal actions. Um, for example, here in Montreal, we have a lot of uh, ruelles vertes, which try to encourage uh, communities to grow things and to create safer environments with lots of 
plants um, in those alleys. And there are also other communal actions in Los Angeles, for example, where uh, activists are trying to uh, encourage the community, especially the youth, to uh, learn how to grow fresh produce because they live in food deserts, for example. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts or if you could expand a little bit more on communal action uh, over individual and systematic actions. I mean, I'll, you know, pr I'm pro. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a global problem that has poses challenges at every level and we need to respond to it at every level. Um, and a little bit to echo Amitav's point about, you know, the rhetorical modulation of the climate community, I often find that there's a it's, a, it's a little bit of a false binary, as you're suggesting. You know, we talk about individual action, we talk about systemic change. It's also everything in between. It's also stuff maybe below the individual level and above the system. I mean, it's, you know, we, we um, there's not any one, I mean, first of all, like, we're not going to solve this. We're going to deal with it. But there's not you know, there's not one path to dealing with it either. We're going to deal with it in a million different ways and a million different levels. And the more, um, the more levers we can pull and the more tools we can put in our toolkit, the better. Uh, the one thing I would say there is that I think a lot of these communal uh, initiatives like planting trees, greenery, etc., are very good. But I think there's another level of communal engagement which is very important. We have to remember that behind all of this, there are certain cultural imperatives. And I'll just give you a couple of basic examples. I mean, you know, when I was a kid uh, in India, uh, if you walked out of a room and left a light on, you would get into serious trouble. Uh, with your parents, you know, if, uh, if you walked out and left a fan going, my God, you had to really, uh, you really copped it, you know. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I grew up like that. I still think like that. My children, I couldn't get them to, do, uh, to follow these basic dictates. And today, if you go to India, young Indians, uh, uh, you know, they've been acculturated in a completely different way, basically sort of acculturated into this, uh, into this uh, culture of waste, you know. So I think uh, that's a very important part of cultural work that one needs to do, uh, you know, to, uh, to as it were, dissent uh, dissent uh, incentivize or to, uh, to undermine these forms, of, uh, these forms of wastefulness. Hi, uh, I was wondering if, uh, Professor Gosh, you wrote in CF Poppies about some uh, history of like mercantile and structural things and you did a lot of research in those areas and can you speak to like the structural questions of you know it seems like the third rail is like talking about capitalism and how that is part of the issue in addition to let's say oil and gas and dirty pollution and things like that and can you just touch on how do you view that maybe in addition to the local actions and the indigenous wisdom and things like that uh, sure. <laughs> but it's a bit, I mean, in summary, in a, in a brief way. Uh, oh, well, you know, I wrote this trilogy of novels uh, called the Ibis Trilogy, which is largely centered on the 19th century opium trade, where the uh, the British uh, the, the British colonial state in India, uh, you know, started creating these large monocultures of opium, which they then shipped to China. Um, so uh, my research for that has, uh, I, I've actually written um, a nonfiction book about it, which just came out in India and will be out uh, in uh, the US and Canada in February next year. It's called Smoke and Ashes, and it's really about the 19th century opium trade. And also, uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, the, uh, a lot of it is about uh, the Americans, early Americans from the uh, 19th century, the Boston Brahmins, who almost all made their money in the opium trade. Uh, so many major families, and the ways in which, uh, you know, capitalism emerges. So many of the institutions of modern capitalism emerges from this pattern of addiction. And I think it holds many, uh, many lessons for uh, climate activism today, because actually uh, the anti-opium movement which arose wild, uh, worldwide uh, in the late 19th century were eventually able and these were popular movements, uh, you know, churches, religious groups, uh, lots of, uh, you know, just voluntary people who created this, uh, uh, this worldwide movement, which were ultimately able to force empires, uh, and the empires, European empires, were the 
more powerful in the 19th century, and they were the basic, uh, they were the basic uh, uh, guarantors of uh, uh, the opium trade, the Dutch Empire, French Empire, British Empire, but they were ultimately forced uh, to accept uh, uh, to accept regulations on uh, on the opium trade, uh, which was actually uh, what made it possible for them to keep these empires going in Asia. And it's not, I think, a coincidence that not long after uh, the opium regulations were put in place, that is, uh, around about 1930, 35, uh, these empires collapsed. Um, we have time for two more questions, just so everyone knows, but then we'll, we'll meet everyone outside the theater for the book signing. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the talk, and thank you very much to Art Speaks to have this talk free. That's, I think it's really important to have free. Uh, today, there's a very important AI uh, meeting in Montreal, and it's like, $1,000 to go there, but here it's free. It's very important, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so you've been talking about the Pope Francis, and uh, I was looking at the, well, everybody knows about, I mean, I guess most of people know about David, you know, this old story and Goliath, you know, but uh, Amitav, I, I, I'm reading a limitless luster name of Lord Buddha, one who is having endless splendor. Is it you? Uh, uh, the meaning of my name? Yeah. Yes. Okay, it's beautiful. <laughs> so uh, the question is about religion and um, addiction, against addiction. So you've been talking about the Pope, like Pope Francis who wrote like our common house. Uh, I'm not religious, but my wife is religious and uh, it's a very interesting space to be. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I wonder, uh, for, through your study, right now, well, if, if you say like the Pope is the only one talking about it, is there other people talking about like in India, in China, in, in the global south? You know, there's a big uh, revolution going out right now in Mali and uh, Burkina Faso and Niger. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they're taking back their, the the empire they had before the French and the English, you know. So who would be like, let, let's say, the three heroes, the three David for the 21st century that you've been looking at? Like, uh, well, we have uh, Greta Thunberg, the Pope. So who, who else can we put in, in this list? Um, well, uh, thank you for that question. Actually, I've talked about this at great length in my book, The Great Derangement. I, in fact, compared uh, the Pope's Laudato Si uh, encyclical with uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, you know, uh, you know the rhetoric of, um, of both. I think the Laudato Si, just as a piece of rhetoric, is just amazing. It's amazing writing. Because uh, what the Pope does there is that he has a lot of, uh, you know, very, very good uh, scientific uh, information and advice. But he, he tries to open up this language to reach the poor. And he, because he worked as a parish priest, as a Jesuit, uh, working amongst the poor, he knows what the poor people can understand, you know. And I think that, it, just rhetorically speaking, it's an amazing document. And I think it's also the most visionary uh, document that's been written uh, um, about these issues because what the Pope is talking about is really what we all know fundamentally to be the case, which is that we have to change our ways of relating to the earth, you know, to relating to each other, to the earth, to the atmosphere, to the environment. And I think, you know, there are actually now many other... Uh, that, I don't know if you can call them religious groups necessarily, but many other groups uh, that are coming together in agreement on these issues. So, uh, uh, you know, earth-centered religions are now said to be the fastest growing religions on the planet. You know, uh, in the West, also in China, also in, uh, in India, elsewhere. So this is definitely, uh, this is certainly something to be optimistic about. Unfortunately, other organized religions uh, have not responded to the Pope's uh, challenge. He's unique in his way. But, uh, you know, most other religions have become captured by uh, prosperity gospels of various kinds, you know. Uh, 
which are just a sort of uh, adapting religious ideas to uh, capitalism, you know, which is very sad. It's happened in every religion now, really. David, you, do you have like some heroes for, for the 21st century? <laughs> Well, you mentioned Greta. I mean, I, you know, I, I find Greta an absolutely amazing world historical figure. And um, in part because of all the other people that she's inspired. But, you know, I, I think it's, you know, in telling the story of the last five years, it's hard to tell that story without her. And you have, you know, she's a starting in 2018, the summer of 2018, August 2018, a friendless, lonely 15-year-old with a single sign sitting outside of Swedish Parliament. By that January, she's yelling at world leaders in Davos and within a few months has inspired a movement of millions all around the world um, to take action, and what I find, by which I mean protest primarily, and what I find most inspiring about that connects to the points we were talking about earlier about agency. You know, I'm a pretty well-off straight white man from the United States, and I feel intimidated by the scale of this challenge, right? And the climate strikers all around the world are largely, you know, under 18, they mostly don't live in democracies. Those who do live in democracies aren't yet um, endowed with the right to vote. Um, many of them are ethnic minorities in places where that's not very comfortable. Many of them are um, LGBTQ in places where that's not comfortable. And those people about as far from the halls of true power that you could possibly be on this earth looked at the same scale of the challenge that I'm humbled by and thought, I'm not gonna accept the terms of that. I'm gonna make a place for myself at the table and I'm gonna make my voice heard. So, um, you know, I, I don't just think of Greta, I think of, um, you know, climate activists from all around the global south, Vanessa Nakate, Disha Ravi, like um, a huge number of hugely inspiring young people who just didn't accept the terms of power that had seemed to the rest of the world to govern their place in the climate conversation and have fundamentally reshaped at least the rhetoric and to some degree the policy of the entire planet in just a few years by refusing to take that deal. And you know that's incredibly inspiring to me. It's also humiliating. Think about how many people who are so much closer to positions of power, who've done so much less and put so much of less of their lives on the line um, than many of these climate strikers, um, especially across the global south. So when I'm thinking about you know, great heroes of the last five years, my, you know, I think um, you know, very, very quickly about not just Greta, um, who started this movement um, or reinvigorated it, um, but all of the people who were inspired by her, um, by her rhetoric, to take to the streets themselves, um, and for to whom we have, I think, a different trajectory of the planet's climate future. We have them to thank for that. Hello, thank you very much for an interesting discussion. So I'm a professor here at the Universe Montreal in Atmospheric Biogeosciences, and my main interest is in under better understanding how carbon cycle is affected by climate change with a focus on the Canadian Arctic. So I travel to the Canadian Arctic four or five times per year. My family is in Germany, and I fly around the world to attend conferences and have similar discussions and presentations. I often get a question how I feel personally about my carbon footprint, which is absolutely terrible. The worst you can possibly imagine. By traveling well, to could, Canadian it could be Arctic, worse, I'm sure. Pardon me? You could be flying private. Yeah. Uh, it could be worse. Yeah. So my question is, I mean, how do you feel personally about your own carbon footprint when traveling to events like tonight? <laughs> 
Um, I'd be curious to know what Amitav has to say. My own view, you know, my own view is, um, you know, I, I, whatever, I buy offsets. I know they're probably um, junk offsets, but I, I do do that. Um, I try to fly um, less rather than more. Um, I tr you know, I try to drive, uh, you know, drive less. I try to eat less red meat. And, you know, I try to do all the things that one can do to reduce one's footprint. Um, but I think in general... Um, what is often called climate hypocrisy really is an aspiration that we might be better together than we are as individuals, and I don't think that we should shame that. Um, if I am advocating, or anybody is advocating for, you know, political policy changes that might enable a world um, to run in a much more carbon neutral way, um, I think that's, you know, that's worth doing, even if it means. Um, some carbon, you know, some larger carbon footprint right now. And I know Amitav has slightly more complicated feelings about some of this stuff um, having to do with the possibility of actually neutralizing our impact on the environment. But if you let yourself imagine a carbon neutral future, a net zero future, um, these trade-offs are much less relevant. Um, if what we're doing is traveling around the world in um, carbon neutral ways, we don't have to feel nearly as guilty about it. There may be some environmental costs, but they're not nearly as large. And for me, the most important thing is trying to do what we can to bring about that future, rather than um, worrying about our contributions on the margins. And I s essentially suspect that, you know, we are talking about capitalism earlier, um, this is one of the sort of the underbellies of that same um, structure, is that we are told to take responsibility for the planet on our own as individuals, when that's impossible. Um, and almost instructed that the larger changes are um, beyond our grasp. And that's a natural feeling. It has some truth to it. But I also think it's insidious kind of propaganda, um, which makes us feel guilty about the lives that we lead as opposed to, you know, empowered to, to change them. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to challenge you or anything. I'm more trying to find inspiration how to answer that question. Because like I said, I get the question all the time. How do you study climate change and you fly around the world nonstop? You're never at home. You're always gone. You're always at an airport. You're always going from A to B. And just trying to yeah, hear your thoughts on this. Right? Yeah, no, I, I think not, it's I'm, important I, I, to go I to I hope I didn't sound defensive. I was just, okay. um, I, I think in general, like the, the thing I would really emphasize is, is um, we live in a world that is broken when it comes to carbon. Um, that shouldn't be an excuse not to like agitate and advocate to change things. That's a reason to agitate and advocate to change things. And you can be inspiring locally and not travel. I know a lot of people who've, who've, who've made those choices more emphatically than I have. Um, but, you know, the ultimate goal here is, is bringing about some more awareness and change. And I think, you know, coming to settings like this, speaking in places like this is, is part of that project. Amitav, how do you answer it or think about um, it? Well, I try to do the thing, uh, you know, uh, travel less, etc. But I think, you know, we are faced with a grim choice. Uh, one is that if we vacate these spaces, then those spaces are going to be taken, uh, uh, taken over by uh, people who, are, you know, by the evil ones, if you like. Uh, or, or, the, or they're Good going point. to be, or the conversation just isn't going to happen. So especially, uh, you know, I find that, uh, you know, when I'm in India, for example, or in many other places, uh, and I start talking about these things, it starts a conversation, which, uh, you know, a public conversation, which would not have happened in my absence. You know, so I think it's... Uh, you know, I travel to India to talk about these things, so I went the other direction, right? So <laughs> Yes. So there you are. I mean, I think, uh, you know, either way, we, uh, we lose, so to speak. On that note. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, Amitabh. And thank all of you for being here and for turning up in such numbers. And uh, with that, I invite you to get your books. And uh, hopefully, we can all get copy signs in 30 minutes. <laughs>